Hi everybody, this is Brian Eisenberg. Welcome to Always Be Testing, the power of small, incremental, continuous improvement to improve the quality of your marketing. For the last almost 12 years, I've been focused on helping companies improve their marketing and improve their conversion rates. And it comes to no surprise to me in today's marketplace that a lot of the things that are people are getting excited about and getting focused on are still not the very things that I've been preaching for the last decade. And so what I wanted to share with you today was a little bit of a story um, that started just about 10 years ago or so when we were working with one of our very first uh, paying customers. His name was Jason Cement. He was the CEO of Magmol.com. And uh, he was uh, trying to improve his business and, and, and get more sales, and he was talking to an incubator and trying to raise money uh, because a competitor of his, E! News, uh, had just finished raising close to $100 million in funding, uh, of course, to get lots of people to subscribe to magazines from their website. And uh, the one thing for sure is back then, both websites really weren't very good. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if you had to compare no funds to $100 million, you'd assume that the site with $100 million would be the huge success. Of course, you know, they can invest in all kinds of marketing efforts, all kinds of innovative ideas, um, and, and spend more on driving traffic than the smaller site with no funding. Well, we worked with Jason um, and started making some small changes to his website, added a unique value proposition, cleaned up the navigation, slowly started making changes to the, the, to the color scheme. Eventually, a couple of years later, we redesigned the website, and you can see it looks a lot more professional back then. Um, you know, we talked about all the great benefits that he has to help make people dive right into some of the key magazines that were uh, the main purchases. And um, we took his conversion rate from a 1.11% conversion rate, so a little over 1% of the people who came were purchasing from him, to a 4.93% conversion rate. So almost a five times impact on his conversion rate. Where at the very same time as this success that, that Jason was achieving, uh, eNews unfortunately had to regret people that the eNews.com website had been closed. The $100 million, of course, and all the great innovation and great marketing couldn't make people buy from them. Uh, and in the end, Jason's still in business today. And, and the main reason is because he focused on this concept of continuous improvement. He just said, look, I can keep improving the experience for my customers, improve my conversion rate, make my traffic more profitable, and that my dollars stretch further. And of course, that was a huge success for him. Now, this is not a new concept. In fact, W. Edward Deming, who was sent by the U.S. government after World War II to Japan to help their economy prosper, uh, taught them the concept of total quality management, of, of quality control, and, and, and of improving the experience um, that people had with the, their uh, manufacturing. In fact, Deming's whole premise was about improving the quality will reduce your expenses, so improve the quality of your experience, your workers, and gaining market share and of course that's exactly what we're trying to do and it's the same kind of concept that we'll be talking about today that will help your marketing and your business improve by focusing in on the right aspects See, in most organizations, the way they make decisions around marketing and improving their business is around what my good friend Avinash Kaushik likes to call the hippo, right? Uh, the highest paid person's opinion in the room uh, versus being data driven. And of course, you know, whenever we're around hippos, there's lots and lots of fat around. Um, but it certainly does not answer the, the right questions by being totally focused on the data and making smart decisions. And of course, there's the other extreme where you're so focused on the data, whereas in this Scott Adams cartoon, uh, you need a dashboard application to track your key metrics. That will you'll have more data to ignore when you make your decisions based on company politics. Will the data be accurate? Okay, let's pretend that matters. So. I want to caution you to kind of be careful, not go one extreme or the other, where everything's based on gut or intuition, and the other extremes always has to be based on data. You need to kind of balance this out to make sure you're not always focused on the wrong aspects of this. And what I learned over all these years is that the same aspects that help people focus on weight loss, believe it or not, um, are also the same ones that make them effective in conversion optimization. In fact, since um, April of 2009, I've lost over 50 five pounds um, by focusing in on doing small things, small meals, 
small rewards, small bits of exercise, and increasing them ever so much. Um, and the small thing that focused on trimming the fat, it's not like I've gotten rid of anything that I really enjoy, because that's what a lot of people are concerned about when they hear the terms trim the fat that you're going to cut out quality. No, in fact, what we're going to focus on is increasing your corporate metabolism and improving the quality of your customer experience. And by doing that, the key is about focusing in on the people. See, optimization is about understanding people's motivation, what makes them want to do the things they do, and influencing to take the right actions. It's not about mathematical models and statistics and, 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 and analysis. Don't get me wrong. I love all of those, and they're all important in their play. But at the end, if you can't focus on what matters more to people, like making the decision between eating a healthy snack like an apple or you know, rich, delicious truffles, you're really not hitting the mark. You're not going to get it by testing, you know, Granny Smith apples with Cortland apples. It, you really have to have these big, wider extremes to make sure you're hitting on all the right notes. See, what the Japanese realized very early on with Wetter Deming was that this process of continuous improvement, uh, Kaizen uh, or Six Sigma, is really, really powerful in improving um, your business. See, if 50 years ago you had the opportunity to invest in either General Motors or Toyota, for sure you would have invested in General Motors. They had all the marketing muscle, all the great innovation, they had all the models everybody wanted, and Toyota's vehicles just weren't all that great. But by focusing on the continuous improvement process, there's a great story of when Ford was working with Mazda and they were trying to create transmissions. And they gave the exact specifications, the exact same materials, and at the end, people loved the Mazda transmissions and weren't crazy about the Ford transmissions, only because their tolerance levels for what they'd accept as a failure rate made the ride so much smoother. And in fact, even 30 years ago, people didn't want cars necessarily that were the Japanese made but today it's the largest share of the market and unfortunately uh, General Motors for example is dying from cardiac arrest because they have not been able to trim the fat so hopefully today I will t tell you how to move from just planning your marketing which is what every marketer loves to do to not only measuring the marketing which of course is critical today and today we have measurements everywhere but how to focus on the key aspect of improving your marketing because ultimately that is the key to success you need all three steps in a continuous process, being that treadmill of continuous improvement to get the success that you need. In fact, in the last decade, all the companies that have been usually successful, have made marks and, and become well branded, are all companies that focus on these two aspects, customer experience and continuous improvement. In fact, some of you may even recognize this page. Um, this is the first landing page for Amazon.com. And they really are the poster child for improving customer experience online and focusing in on the customer. In fact, I think one of the greatest examples of Amazon.com is, first of all, how they leveraged what I call the Tom Sawyer effect, right, where Tom invited all his friends to come help him paint uh, the wall while he did very little work. Well, of course, Amazon got lots of people to come in and submit reviews to their products, leveraging the first social media word of mouth in terms of building their sales vehicle. But more than that, they've always focused on improving the conversion rate. No matter how small it is, they focused on improving little details on their website. In fact, at any given time on Amazon, you can have up to 200 tests running. One of those classic examples is one of my favorites. It's just this one little area, what I call the ready to buy area. All the stuff around their add to cart button that they've evolved over the years. And again, not that add to cart buttons are the most impactful things in the world, but if Amazon can focus on this over and over again throughout the years, they realize there's always opportunities, small gains that are continue to be had by focusing in on this area. Now, this one screenshot is taken from the late 90s where they used to everybody used to be concerned back then if you hit the wrong button you'd blow up the world start war games or something like that and you'll notice Amazon had the lock on there they talked about shopping with us is safe guaranteed and the, the hyperlink to that on the button itself it said at the shopping cart you can always remove it later and of course I want to remind people that they were buying from amazon.com a couple of years later they modified that and they now started offering their true innovation which was obviously their one click and they were able to remove the lock from there. They removed the shopping with us is safe guaranteed. But they still kept the language you can always remove it later on the button. Again, the point of action assurance, which we'll talk a lot about throughout the course, really made a big difference on their button. And of course, they used a little bit more provocative headline than buy from Amazon.com and changed it to ready to buy. Shortly afterwards, 
they got rid of the you can always remove it later from the buttons and move it to underneath the ready to buy and said you can always cancel later. But what's interesting is they made the button smaller and that whole space a little shorter only so they can focus on selling their used items. What was interesting here is they actually reduced their conversion rate but increased their revenue because selling used books means they didn't have to warehouse, they didn't have people touch it, all they had to do was sell email and collect fees. So they were able to sacrifice a little bit of the customer experience for increased revenue. That's always the balance you need to have. Shortly thereafter, uh, they did a redesign. They added a little more shadowing and beveling to their site and, of course, to their button. They started promoting A9. wasn't a huge success. And just a couple of years ago, they added now a pull-down to their quantity menu because in case you wanted to order more than one item. So again, just this one area, continuous improvement over the years to improve their conversion rate. But the key to all this, and again, you can't test everything all the time, is focusing in on prioritization. And I was very fortunate very early on to work with a good friend of mine by the name of Sam Decker, who's now the chief marketing officer for Bizarre Voice, who provides customer reviews and, and, and social uh, commerce platform um, for retailers and manufacturers. And what he did is he asked us to analyze the Dell e-commerce website, the business consumer website, and come up with a list of recommendations that he could improve just before he was ready to leave that position to move on to another position. And we went ahead and we analyzed the site, and we probably gave him a report that was somewhere between 60 and 70 pages of all the different things he can improve. And what he did is he went through every single one of those and said, look, I'm going to prioritize them based on the resources that it's going to need, the impact it's going to have, what resources it's going to need, and also what is it going to matter to our organization. And what he came up with is this one test, which wasn't the most impactful test, but it really was a test that was going to get people at Dell thinking differently about their customers and how they go through their purchase process as opposed to just changing things around for the sake of, of improving conversion rates randomly. And if you know the configurator, you know when you get multiple options as you're trying to shop, um, they used to have the words, learn more. And we recommended that they change those words to help me choose because when you're ready to shop you don't want to learn you want to buy so you want them to help you choose and that one change has accounted for tens of millions of dollars over the years um, and again nothing on, on the content afterwards changed but it got people thinking about wow the words my customers are thinking about matter in the purchase process now the way you prioritize always fall down to these three things number one your resources right what do you have available to make changes if you don't have designers don't make design changes make copy changes um, if you don't have programmers you know make design changes that's okay make whatever you have available possible and whatever you can invest you don't have to invest you know 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week of your team into um, improvements to focus on five hours or 10 hours or 20 hours as long as you're focusing a little bit of your resources into it. The second piece is you need people. And we'll talk about what kind of people you need, but you need people who are going to be able to make the changes, identify the changes, really, really critical. And thirdly, it always comes down to your culture. What's going to matter to your culture? It may not be the most impactful test, but if it's going to make a difference in the way your organization thinks or your hippo thinks, absolutely critical to focus in on that culture aspect. But where the biggest breakdown happens in older organizations in terms of con uh, conversion optimization is in their budgets. See, unfortunately, in today's marketplace, as well as been for the last 40 years, everybody's focused on bringing in traffic. Like if we bring more people, it's a numbers game. And eventually, if we have more people, we'll sell more people. And it's sort of true, but unfortunately, it's like pouring w water into a leaky bucket. People will eventually leave. And unless you fill up that bucket, um, you lose more and more those people and they have a, an experience with your brand that may not be positive so instead of focusing all your money on pay-per-click and paper call and banner advertising and affiliate marketing and email marketing you need to focus on usability testing and web analytics and interpreting that web analytics and testing and copywriting and improving your internal search and all the other aspects that improve the online experience once they reach your website as opposed to all of the things that are off your website and when you focus a little bit of that budget on the conversion optimization you're bound to get better results. See, most people don't have a traffic problem. In fact, I had a prospect come up to me and told me he had 60,000 total visitors to his website. And I found out his traffic was extremely well targeted. Only about 10% of the people who were coming to his website were leaving immediately. That means they had a very low bounce rate that he was able to record in his analytics report, right? People came and they stuck to the website. They kept clicking.
Now, what that means, if only 10% were disqualified, um, that left them with about 54,000 qualified visitors. And in a typical marketplace, depending on how complex your sale, it usually is about 30 to 70% of your customers are in the marketplace to purchase today or this week or whatever the timeline is for your purchase cycle. Uh, in fact, McAfee did some great research that showed in digital window shopping or the time it takes from adding an item to your cart until you actually purchase is roughly a day and a half. So not surprising, 30 to 70% are in the market. I said that left them with about 30,000 potential buyers. And unfortunately, only 1,000 of them were actually completing their orders. So the opportunity to improve the experience and improve the conversion rate happens with these extra 29,000 people. And if all they did is focused on improving the conversion rate for 500 more people to convert or 1,000, they'd nearly double their business. You don't need to focus on driving more traffic at this point, just on improving the experience of the people that come to your website. Now, the three key resources you need in order to make this happen is, I said, number one, the people. You need someone for marketing. You need someone to own the process, someone who's going to make the business decisions and prioritize what happens first. You also need someone to analyze the data and tell you where your biggest opportunities for improvement are. You also need your creative resources, your graphic designers, your copywriters, your flash people. And you'll need some level of technical resources to maybe copy and paste some code um, of your testing tags and your analytics tags into here to make sure you can I, make the changes that you need to. The second thing you're going to need is the tools. And um, unfortunately today, the tools aren't an obstacle. You can get Google Website Optimizer for free, and it can test hundreds of different things on your website. And there's other great tools that we talk about further in our course that you can use to improve your conversion rate, many of them free or low cost. But ultimately, what you really need is the process. And the process is what we plan to teach you through the course of conversion optimization. You need a way to go from plan, measure, to improve, and then back again. And that process is a process I developed with my brother Jeffrey Eisenberg and John Cordo von Tiverdar, who's a good friend of mine and a former uh, uh, rocket scientist for NASA. And the questions, though amazingly simple, are incredibly powerful. The first question is, who are we trying to persuade? It's much easier to persuade someone or get someone to take action when you know who you're talking about. Now, if you know all the details about someone, it's obviously much easier. And, and um, in an ideal situation, you can personalize your offer. But in many cases online, we don't have all that level of detail. So we're going to talk about a process that's more akin to personalization. And I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a couple of moments. The second question is, what action do we want them to take? In other words, do we want them to subscribe, to, to become a lead, to register, to download a white paper, to forward a link? What is the action we want them to take? And not only that big macro action of this buy or, or, or subscribe, but also the little micro actions. What action do we want them to take on this page on our website and on the next page on our website and on the next page of the website? And then number three, what action do they want to take? Your visitors on your website because they decided to be there. They're in control of the experience and they're there to accomplish a task, whatever that task may be. And our job is to marry our goals with their goals and give them the information they need in order to feel confident that they're accomplishing their task and taking the action they want to, all in the while taking the action we want them to take. Now, the way we personalize this is human psychology. Human beings since the beginning of time have been hardwired, left brain, right brain, right? More logical approach, more emotional approach. We also have preferences in terms of the way we gather information and the way we make decisions, whether we're more deliberate or whether we make decisions quickly or gather information quickly. I call these four areas competitive, spontaneous, methodical, humanistic. Now, if you follow Kiersey, if you follow Young, Myers-Briggs, Hippocrates, they've all had different names for them, but they all basically fall into the four same categories of emotional, logical, quick, and deliberate. Now, it's interesting because we see these patterns all over the place. In fact, usability guru Jacob Nielsen did an eye tracking analysis on the U.S. Census Bureau website. And when he did his analysis, he identified there were four unique patterns of eye tracking. Now, it didn't surprise me or my staff when we looked at this because we said, of course, there are four, four basic human hardwires or operating systems, essentially, in the way we gather information. 
And so if you look at these four, and we'll look at them in detail, you can see this one, which is the competitive pattern. They stick towards the top of the page. Maybe look at a couple of bullet points, grab the information quickly and logically. No motions involved here. The methodical, they are slow, deliberate, but very logical. They look at all the different data points. They spend time looking at all the different data points. R look at how they look through all the navigation. Really, really critical to deal with these people in the most appropriate way. Again, methodicals, uh, deliberate and logical. Spontaneous people, they're attracted to the interaction. Pictures of people, and you can see they hit right to those points. They're attracted to those kind of things. And then lastly, the humanistic person, who again is a little bit more deliberate, but they're emotionally involved. Okay. And what we do with this is we create our personas, our predictive models that are going to help us understand the buying process and understand what our customers want to achieve. Now, you can create simple personas as you know, people who know about our brand, people who don't know about our brand, people who know about what they're purchasing from us, people who don't know, repeat visitors and new visitors, uh, people who are competitive or spontaneous or methodical, humanistic, some very basic segmentation, people come from search versus people who come from social media. All of this, those things can give us different aspects of how to think about what we're trying to achieve. Or you can combine a lot of complex uh, details about them to create robust personas, real rich narrative that can be multiple pages long that feel to your research organization or to your uh, you know senior executives that they're very, very, very detailed in understanding of who these customers are and help us build empathy to understand what content they're going to need in order to us fill the gap of information they need in order to take that action in the persuasion architecture process. Now, the nice thing today is that it's very easy to test everything. right? With something like Google Website Optimizer, you can go ahead and you can test a headline to see if it could appeal, appeal more to a competitive personality type. Or you can go ahead and you can test an image to see if it'll appeal better to your spontaneous personality type. You can test anything on the page, any copy or creative. And what we can do with this process, though, is make it simple for us to identify what to test. For example, we were working with Overstock.com several years ago, and they had this one page, their movie page, where they had a 91.8% abandonment rate. And that means almost 92 out of every 100 people came to this website left it immediately. And if you look at the page closely, they list a whole bunch of the different movies, their top 10, uh, Lord of the Ring was a popular movie at the time, what the coming soon, the new releases, the featured picks. Um, and a typical way that most people would approach in conversion optimization improving this page is they use multivariate testing. They take every single section of the site and change it over, come up with a bunch of variations around it, move it around, and hope that at some point they get an improvement conversion rate. And that's certainly one approach to do this. Unfortunately, what I find when most people do this is that they're doing what I call slice and dice optimization. For every single one of those segments, you need to come up with different versions of your creative. You need to come up with all these variations. You need to invest traffic to see all these variations in order to determine which one is the best winner. And what happens is it invests a lot of resources that most people can't afford to use up. I can imagine that most people who are listening to this uh, don't have endless resources. So let's use our persuasion architecture process to identify a simpler way to improve this page. So now we look at this page and we look at the four basic personality types. That's all we're going to do on this one. We're going to look at spontaneous people. Spontaneous people, when they're looking at movies, they look to, for the top sellers and new releases. And as you can see on this page, this page does a great job talking about the top 10, the feature picks, the new releases. This is what this is heaven for the spontaneous people. We don't have to do anything to improve the page for them. The humanistic people, they care about reviews. Now, Overstock.com had hundreds of thousands of reviews, and unfortunately, none of them were going to appear on this page. But in order to get them on this page, we were going to have to involve what I like to call the business prevention unit or the IT group. So we're going to hold off a little bit on them. Eventually, we'll get across to improving the experience for them. Now, the methodicals, we know they're slow and deliberate um, and, and, and logical. They'll take their time looking around to figure out where to click to go next. And there actually is a place where they can click to dig in by genre. But the competitives are the ones that concern me. If you remember the eye tracking studies that I showed you with uh, Jacob Nielsen, they're the ones who search quickly at the top of the page. They look for the actor, the title. If they don't see immediately what they're looking for, how to get what they're looking for, they're out of there.
And what we recognized right away is the top of the page, right next to the search engine, there was a banner. Whenever you put the two things together, people think they're associated. And what happened is that when people looked at the search engine, they associated kids titles for learning and fun with the search engine, that maybe they were going to look for kids titles. And so I called up the CEO that night and I said, Patrick, please change the graphic on that page so we can appeal to the competitors. All I want you to do is take a before and change it with this one after. One graphic. And that one graphic was worth almost $25 million. It increased their revenue by 5% on a $480 million. Every day they did not fill that hole, they were losing almost $68,000. This is the power of small incremental improvements. Yes, this was a big improvement, but focusing in on the little details by making small changes as opposed to massive changes, you can get great results. Now, this doesn't only apply just to websites. You can also do this for all of your marketing. In fact, here's a great example that happened with Office Depot. They were going ahead and they launched this concept called the Penny Pranks, where they took this gentleman and they put a hidden camera on him and they went around buying things with pennies. Now, what they did is they launched bunches of different videos to figure out which was going to be the most effective, which one got the most views, which one got the most comments, which one people watched the most using uh, YouTube insights. And they finally settled on one that was going to be the winner based on all of these metrics. Now, they couldn't have scripted this any better. Um, and, and if you've ever been to some of the stories that happened in New York, you might even experience something like this. And what happened is the whole time they were running this campaign, they went ahead and they promoted it on their website with the power to the penny. Uh, again, of course, because as people were watching those videos and passing them along and sharing them, they were coming to the website and it was producing great results. And then once they found the winner on YouTube and online, they launched it as part of their television campaign much more cost effective instead of spending millions on a TV commercial and they don't know if it was going to perform launch it online check your metrics and then declare a winner this again illustrates the power of small details of focusing in on those small increases see which one's going to incrementally give you a better result and it's kind of like compounding interest right you can go ahead and improve your conversion rate by as little as five percent a month and it doesn't sound like it's a lot and it may only take a few hours a month to get to that point but at the end of the year you'll have increased your conversion rate by over eighty percent that's almost double your business just by focusing in on a five percent increase every single month the key is you need to focus on improving your corporate metabolism. Every day you need to focus on improving your marketing. Whether it's 10 minutes here and 20 minutes there, you can always identify, and through this course we'll show you how you can identify those opportunities, where you can identify those opportunities, and then what to do in order to improve it, to focus in on your personas and on your customers, to give them the right experience to become great. See, execution is not a one-time event of launching a campaign or launching a new website. It's not a one-time push towards achieving that goal. Rather, it's a way of life, as Guy Kawasaki said. It's about continuously focusing on improving the experience and grabbing more market share. I wish you the best of luck because persuasion architecture works. The process has been working for well over a decade and it will continue to work. The question is will you work the process?